Hey everyone, welcome to Travel Through Stories. My name is Sean, and today I want to talk about Antonio Scarati's M, Son of the Century, translated from the Italian by Anne Milano Appel. And this was published just a couple of months ago in 2022. This was the last book I read in my entirely unplanned, entirely impromptu summer of the Italian epic, which began with Eleanor Ferrante's Neapolitan novels, moved through Eduardo Albinati's The Catholic School, and ended here with Antonio Scarati's M, Son of the Century. M, Son of the Century is the first book in a proposed trilogy. I believe the second book is already published in Italian, though I'm not sure when it's being translated. And it charts the rise of Benito Mussolini and the National Fascist Party in Italy in the late 1910s and early 1920s. This book ends in 1925. And it's a documentary fiction recreating the political arguments and the political upheavals of the time period. And thus, this book works in a way as a kind of cautionary tale for modern times. I mean, it's extraordinarily depressingly relevant today. I mean, it's even more so relevant today than it was when I read this book a couple of months ago. And the very fact that Scarati chose to write this book indicates that he doesn't believe that fascism is dead. And so M, Son of the Century, is as much a diagnosis of fascism in the early 20th century as it is a diagnosis of the fascism in the 21st century. It's about how fascism took hold in Italy so quickly and how it could do so again. Perhaps Scarati didn't expect Italy to uh, vote in a vocal supporter of Mussolini only four years after this book was published in Italian, but here we are. The political theories and the sociological concepts explored in this book echo into the modern world, and perhaps that's the best reason to read this book, to better understand the roots of fascism so when it begins or continues to bubble up around you, you're ready to recognize it and combat it. And so while this book is overtly political in so many different ways, it is literary historical fiction, and it might be more descriptive to call it documentary fiction. See, this novel is interlaced with historical documents, which act as kind of epigraphs or addendums to each chapter. Each chapter basically usually ends with two or three direct quotes from the newspapers at the time, which were written by the characters in this book, often Mussolini and a bunch of his cronies. And so the preceding chapter is essentially a restaging of what led to that document being written. This book is very much a conscious uh, restaging or redramatization or what have you of these primary sources from the time. And the reason why this book is so ingrained with these historical documents is because these newspaper clippings are really where fascism got its start. The way Mussolini rose to power, especially in the early stages, is really in the rhetorical battles that he and his allies waged in Italian, uh, Italy's newspapers. Obviously, he used physical violence as well, but this was really preceded by the battles that he waged in the newspapers. And it really makes you, well, think about how weak his political opponents really were rhetorically, as they were either too afraid to combat his ideas directly and openly, or they were just completely incompetent. All of this should sound quite familiar. And it makes you think about how shockingly easy it is to convince a populace of adopting fascism. And interestingly, in this novel, Scarati isn't interested in elevating the drama of these physical or verbal battles. Nor is he particularly interested in getting at the exact emotions and the exact psychology of the uh, participants. The point of view is always this moderately distant third person, so we're never quite in the heads of any of these characters. Instead, what Scarati does in this novel is offer more or less simply a restatement of the facts. At times, it reminded me a little bit of Jonathan Littell's The Kindly Ones in how it simply restages these horrendous ideas and these horrendous events rather than critically staging them and um, working to subvert or undermine them like you might find in a Dasha Drindich novel. But unlike Littell's The Kindly Ones, Scarazzi's M, Son of the Century, refuses to indulge in the violence and in the perversion of these ideas. That is, this book is a documentary fiction, and it is only interested in recreating and restaging this political movement rather than bringing these characters to life or something like that. The characters always remain different, perhaps because they are these larger-than-life figures, and thus they aren't fully understandable. And all of this sort of leads to two problems with this book. 
The first is that the characters aren't super engaging because they aren't really real. We don't get inside the head of Mussolini, which honestly is fine with me as that's not really a place I'd want to be. And actually, this helps Scarati avoid some of the pitfalls that books like uh, Jonathan Littell's The Kindly Ones fall into. We aren't trapped and seduced by Mussolini in the same way that in The Kindly Ones we are trapped and seduced by Maximilian Aue. But here in M Son of the Century, we are we simply just witness Mussolini and his idiosyncratic and honestly just kind of messy political ideas. And the second main problem with this book is that these historical documents that are interlaced throughout this entire book sort of just restate the main ideas of the chapter preceding it. And thus they often feel redundant, though they do show Scarati's work and they show the direct sources that he's working with. Which I think is interesting because I think it really lays out the work of the historian. Historians take these documents and they create narrative. All history is narrative. And so Scarati, by doing this explicitly, really puts the rhetoric and the narratives that we use to when we talk about fascism and how and why it takes power, he takes those and puts it at the forefront. And this narrative is told in a prose that is bombastic, almost cartoonish at times, though not overly stylized by any means. But when you read the quotes at the end of each chapter, um, you'll really see that Scarati is almost perfectly matching the bombastic tone of the, the newspapers. It really matches the tones of people like Mussolini and Gabriel D'Annunzio and uh, Cesar Rossi and Dumini, etc. These fascists who use this bombastic rhetoric to drum up support for their fake populism. And this kind of bombastic, almost cartoonish rhetoric is popular even today among the kind of fake populists who are simply just fascists that you can find on pretty much any news network. This book opens with a speech that Mussolini gives at the formation of the Fasci di Combattimento, the predecessor to the National Fascist Party. And he makes this grandiose and bombastic speech claiming, the reality that follows every deluge has opened my eyes. Europe is now a stage without actors, all gone. The bearded sages, the monumental historic fathers, the whining, magnanimous liberals, the grand eloquent, cultured, florid orators, the moderates to whose common sense we have owed our ruin from time immemorial, the bankrupt politicians who live in terror of imminent ruin, each day pleading to put off the inevitable event. For all of them the bell has tolled. The men of, the, the men of old will be overrun by this huge mass, five million soldiers bearing down on the territorial borders, five million returning veterans. We must get in step, lockstep. The forecast is not about to change. Bad times still lie ahead. War is still on the agenda. The world is moving towards two big alignments, those who were and those who will be. And of course, because he's a fascist, he's the only one who can lead the charge. Yet these and these alone are my people. I am well aware of it. I am the misfit par excellence, the protector of the demobilized, the lost drifter searching for the way. This passage really gives you a sense of the prose as we get so many of these just self-righteous speeches, these rhetorical moments, which are some of the most important moments in the history of this movement. And we don't only get Mussolini's perspective, we get all of these different characters' perspectives as they argue with each other about how to best make fascism win at the ballot box. Like I noted earlier, while they did fight in the streets, most of this political battle between these political ideologies was fought initially in the newspapers at the time. And by the time it really got down to physical violence, the battle was already pretty close to being won. And like I said, while this book focuses on Mussolini, as the title suggests, we get chapters from all of these different other characters who were instrumental in the rise of fascism in Italy. Most prominent in this book is the character Gabriel D'Annunzio, the ultra-nationalist poet turned fascist. D'Annunzio was at times a, an ally to Mussolini, or at least an accomplice in moving Italy towards the, a fascist state, uh, and at other times he was an opponent to Mussolini. And these two, Mussolini and D'Annunzio, argue at length in the newspapers about how best to market fascism to the populace. And there are others, of course. Uh, Cesar Rossi was another prominent figure in this movement. Rossi argued in the newspapers at the time that the fascists should have a clear policy agenda and be 
transparent about their beliefs. Mussolini disagrees completely, and let me just read you Mussolini's musings, and let me know if this sounds at all familiar. On this point, however, Rossi is mistaken. Mussolini, when Rossi reaches this turn in his argument, usually stops listening to him. Who are we? Wrong question, pointless, even detrimental. A superfluous question because it overestimates the importance of soul searching. Who are the fascists? What are they? Benito Mussolini, their creator, considers it an idle question. Yes, of course, they are something new, something unheard of, an anti-party. That's it. The fascists are an anti-party. They engage in anti-politics. Very well. But then the pursuit of identity must stop there. The important thing is to be something that allows them to avoid the encumbrances of consistency, the dead weight of principles. As for dogmas and the consequent paralysis, Benito Mussolini gladly leaves those to the socialists. Yeah, I mean, I wonder where we've seen this idea, that political tactic of being just against a whole bunch of different things and not really for anything, of only pointing out problems but literally never offering any kind of meaningful solution. Huh. Plusha change and all that. Anyways, this book is fascinating because, at least in the first half of it, it really tracks uh, Mussolini's shift from the Socialist Party, which he was in before the Great War and was expelled from, into what he would find when he founded or helped find the Fasci di Combattimento Party, which would later turn into the National Fascist Party in 1921, which would take control of Italy in 1922 after the, uh, well, the essential coup during the March on Rome. And this shift from socialist to fascist is, again, quite familiar, where these far right-wing goofs use the rhetoric of the left, the rhetoric of populism, and simply pervert it for their own purposes. I could name dozens of journalists and politicians right now who are gladly and happily strolling down this very profitable grift right now. They're not too difficult to spot. One of Mussolini's tactics that is explored at length in this book is to never act but only react. You allow your political opponents to bicker and fight and wear each other down, and then you swoop in at the last moment and take advantage of the situation. But they are just words. When your enemies are slaughtering one another, the only thing to do is wait. And because the enemies are numerous, you have to be able to wait a long time. You have to give iron enough time to rust away, methane to burn off oxygen, the stomach to digest food. He has become good at writing. He is re revolutionary or conservative, depending on the circumstances. He knows it. He's under no illusion about this. He is merely a reactant. You have to give the molecules time to forcefully collide with one another. Again, we're dealing with reactionaries, not people with actual conviction, not people with actual beliefs, but people who are only able to insincerely react Long live reaction, Mussolini proclaimed in a newspaper at the time. And obviously, this isn't the only tactic that was used by the fascists, and this book looks quite closely at the premeditated violence of the time as well. The violence must go on just long enough to make those old bourgeois fools understand that they can't do without the violent bullies. And this violence is obviously noble and necessary in their minds, as Mussolini in a newspaper at the time in 1921 wrote, First of all, we must declare again that, for the fascist, violence is not a whim or an intentional objective. It is not an art for art's sake. It is a surgical necessity, a painful necessity. Secondly, fascist violence cannot be a violence aimed at provo uh, provocation. Finally, fascist violence must be chivalrous. Absolutely, lines are not crossed with impunity. Violence for us is an exception, not a method or a system. Violence for us does not have the quality of personal revenge, but the quality of national defense. <laughs> M, Son of the Century is in many ways a frustrating book because what it really depicts is the fragility of democracy and the incompetence of the moderate liberals to effectively combat fascism. It shows how vulnerable democracy is when up against authoritarians whose only goal is to subvert democracy for their own gain. And it shows how quickly a dissatisfied people can move from a basic shallow centrism to outright fascism in just a couple of years. And of course it shows how right-wing right, right -wing populism is never populism and it's always just fascism. And how these people don't actually care about people or 
ideas in any ways. They simply want power. All people shaken to their innermost core by an irresistible desire to submit to a strong man and, at the same time, to hold sway over the defenseless. They are ready to kiss the shoes of any new master, as long as they too are given someone to trample on. So yeah, an enlightening book that is all too real. Parts of this were a slog to get through as it really chronicles every part of this movement. But I think it did overall a great job of navigating the complicated and completely idiosyncratic ideologies of fascism. I think any time that authors take as their primary subject matter uh, problematic historical figures, they risk elevating them to new heights, mythologizing them in a new way. Scarati, though, is very careful to avoid this, and I think he succeeds in not elevating Mussolini uh, in any real way. Instead, this is an expose, a takedown of a character and of an entire movement that is already praised by those on the far right. M. Son of the Century is, as a blurb from the New York Times on the back of this book, says is an anti-fascist history lesson disguised as a novel. And unfortunately, it only seems to be becoming more and more relevant as time goes on. Anyways, thanks for watching.